Greetings, beloved. Thank you for joining me here at May United Methodist Church for this, our first Sunday of Lent as we begin this season. The theme I'm going to be using throughout the season of Lent is full to the brim. So I invite you to picture perhaps a water fountain where that water is pouring out into some sort of cup or chalice and it fills and then it spills over. This is how I envision, or maybe a cup that you're pouring water in and if you didn't mind making a mess, it would fill and then spill over the edges. Or if you try to get it just to that very top piece of the brim, what does it look like when something is full to the brim and either about to spill over or spilling over? Beloved, throughout this season of Lent, what I want us to do is to invite God to fill us to the brim once again, to open ourselves, to be that open vessel to be that cup, and to say to God, yes, pour your grace into me. Pour your love into me. Fill me up, and then let me spill over into the world so that where I am, your grace and your love are as well. So that is the approach I'm taking, the lens I'm coming through each of the scriptures, um, this sense of each of us being a vessel and sort of realizing you know, I think a lot of people are feeling how I am. My vessel doesn't feel full. Um, I've, I've felt like I've been going on empty a little bit. And that isn't because God isn't pouring it out. That, that's never the case. God is this constant faucet of love and grace. When we feel empty, it is usually because either we are allowing ourselves to be drained, we aren't inviting God to fill us up, we aren't doing the spiritual disciplines, uh, we, we aren't spending time with God in such a way that allows us to refresh and be filled up. And, and we have all kinds of reasons for that, right? There's busyness, there's, you know, crisis that happens, there's just the neglect to our souls. Well, in Lent, as we turn back to God, in Lent, as we realize that one of the sins upon ourselves is this, sorry, one of the drains upon ourselves is the sin that we struggle with. It is the sin of the world that, that we live within. I think of the conflict that is unfolding between Russia and the Ukraine. I think of COVID. I think of other world conflicts. And it is just this pull upon us. And it is not necessarily that we have done anything wrong that has contributed to those events, but we live in a world that is dealing with the consequences of, of this communal sin. We, we all deal with the consequences of these events. And it is, it is pulling upon us. And so now more than ever, we need to allow ourselves to be filled up once again. I invite you to have that heart set and that mindset and that soul set as we enter into worship today. Come, let us walk in the light of the Lord, that the Lord may teach us his ways and that we may walk in his paths. Let us test and examine our ways and return to the Lord. God has blessed us. Let us lift up the cup of salvation and call upon the Lord's name. Let us pray together. Forgiving God of redemption, we confess that we are attracted to false gods and easy answers in life. We are vulnerable to temptation that could damage us in ways that are not obvious. Forgive us that sin draws us like moth to a flame. Restore us and fill us with godly reserve. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. I have two scripture readings to share with you this morning. The first comes out of the Old Testament, out of the book of Deuteronomy. And in it, uh, you'll hear some references to the, the journey of Exodus. Um, and I don't want you to listen so much for the details as the overall idea of what is happening. I want you to hear that in this moment of harvest, in this moment of receiving blessing, how are the people instructed to respond? All right, so I want you to listen for that as you hear these words from Deuteronomy 26, verses 1 through 11. Once you have entered the land your God is giving you as an inheritance, and you take possession of it and settle there, 
Take some of the early produce of the fertile ground that you have harvested from the land the Lord your God is giving you and put it in a basket. Then go to the location the Lord your God selects for his name to reside. Go to the priest who is in office at that time and say to him, I am declaring right now before the Lord my God that I have indeed arrived in the land the Lord swore to our ancestors to give us. Then the priest will take the basket from you and place it before the Lord your God's altar. Then you should solemnly state before the Lord your God. My father was a starving Aramean. He went down to Egypt living as an immigrant there with few family members. But that is where he became a great nation, mighty and numerous. The Egyptians treated us terribly, oppressing us and forcing hard labor on us. So we cried out for help to the Lord, our ancestors' God. The Lord heard our call. God saw our misery, our trouble, and our oppression. The Lord brought us out of Egypt with a strong hand and an outstretched arm with awesome power and with signs and wonders. He brought us to this place and gave us this land, a land full of milk and honey. So now I am bringing the early produce of the fertile ground that you, Lord, have given me. Set the produce before the Lord your God, bowing down before the Lord your God. Then celebrate all the good things the Lord your God has done for you and your family. Each one of you, along with the Levites and the immigrants who are among you. The second scripture reading today comes out of the Gospel of Luke. It's the fourth chapter, the first 13 verses. It is a section of scripture that we tend to know as the temptation of our Lord. It immediately follows the baptism of our Lord Jesus Christ. And so just after the receiving of the Holy Spirit, the, um, Jesus goes into the wilderness um, to spend time fasting, to spend time in prayer. And then he, there he encounters the devil. And the devil seeks to lure Christ away from the mission he has been given here on earth for the purpose that he has come from. I don't want you to listen again so much for the role of the temptation, but to hear instead what it is that Jesus uses to resist those temptations. What it is he says about God and how he seems to understand the presence of God with him even while the things the devil lures him with might actually be tempting, might actually be attractive. And yet there is a connection to God that for Jesus is enough. Hear this story from the Gospel of Luke. Jesus returned from the Jordan River full of the Holy Spirit and was led by the Spirit into the wilderness. There he was tempted for 40 days by the devil. He ate nothing during those days, and afterward, Jesus was starving. The devil said to him, Since you are God's son, command this stone to become a loaf of bread. Jesus replied, It is written, People won't live only by bread. Next, the devil led him to a high place and showed him in a single instance all the kingdoms of the world. The devil said, I will give you this whole domain and the glory of all these kingdoms. It's been entrusted to me and I can give it to anyone I want. Therefore, if you will worship me, it will all be yours. Jesus answered, it's written, you will worship the Lord your God and serve only him. The devil brought him into Jerusalem and stood him at the highest point of the temple. He said to him, since you are God's son, throw yourself down from here, for it's written, he will command the angels concerning you to protect you, and they will take you up in their hands so that you won't hit your foot on a stone. Jesus answered, it's been said, don't test the Lord your God. After finishing every temptation, the devil departed from him until the next opportunity. As you hear the song of reflection and you think about these two passages, I want you again to think of this idea of being full to the brim. 
when we think of the things that tempt us, the needs of our body, the desires for power, for being important, the need perhaps to say, is God all God that says he is? As we are lured into various temptations, whatever those are for us. Jesus leaned on scripture. What are the words? What are the promises? What is the presence of God that fills you up, that you pull from when temptation comes calling? Please consider that while you hear the song of reflection. For the depth and the riches of God's saving grace Flowing down from the cross for me Then the death for my sins by the Savior was paid In his suffering on Calvary Wondrous God, be with us now. We rest in your word. We seek to be renewed in your spirit. Pour out upon us, O oh God, your healing, your redemption, your grace, your love. Fill us to the brim with your word, with your message, with your will for our lives as disciples. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Perhaps the greatest temptation that we struggle with, and when I say we, I am thinking largely of those of us that reside in the United States. That is the culture that I know. That is my perspective of the world. I recognize that there are likely very different temptations in other places. And that even in the United States, this is not a universal thing. That I think it is largely true. And I think it is true for more than just the United States. I think there are a lot of people in the world. We struggle with the temptation for more. It doesn't really matter more of what. There is something in our current world culture that tells us that more is better. More of anything. More food is better. More clothing is better. More electronics is better. More of this is better. More of that is better. More is better. And we should always be striving for more. And built into the false narrative of that temptation is the idea that in more, we will find the happiness we seek. In more, 
contentment will come. In more, loneliness will dissipate. In more, hurt and pain will go away. More will solve all that we struggle with in the moment of less. Hmm. Right? It's a powerful temptation. And so much of what we experience in the world is built around this temptation. It's so subtle. It starts when we are very young. It starts with commercials in a lot of ways. It starts with friendships, which sounds funny, right? But a friend has something we don't have and we want more. A commercial makes a toy that we don't have look amazing or a cereal that we have not yet tasted look amazing and we want more. Perhaps for some of us, it starts within our families. Now, I was an only child, so I did not have to deal with siblings, but I know many of you had siblings, and maybe it looked to you like the sibling had more. And so you wanted what the sibling had. We can call it envy. We can call it jealousy. We can call it discontentment. There is something in us that drives us for more. And again, part of that is this idea that whatever isn't right now with more will be right. This is what the devil is tempting Jesus with. He doesn't use that word, right? But Jesus hasn't eaten for 40 days. Now, I want you to think about a time perhaps where you fasted. I once did a two-day fast. And after 40 hours, I would have eaten the rock. I mean, let's just turn it into bread or don't turn it into bread. I was that hungry. I was like, sure, I'll eat a rock right now. That sounds great, right? I mean, that's just 40 hours. Imagine 40 days. And, you know, yes, Jesus is divine, but Jesus is in a human body. We can only go so long without food. He is likely barely alive in some ways. So how hungry must he be? So if more is attractive when we have enough, Imagine how attractive more is when we feel like we don't have enough. And so the devil says to him, hey, you're hungry. You're the son of God. Turn stuff into bread. Feed your hunger. Give in to the need for more. And Jesus says to him, not in these words, but this is his answer. In the Lord, I have enough. It's okay if my body, my body hungers. It might be uncomfortable. My body might die. But my soul has enough, and that's all that matters. So the devil tries a different approach. Takes Jesus and says, look at all these kingdoms. Look at all this power. You're the son of God. And I'm the devil. I've been entrusted with this stuff. I can give it to you. I can give you everything. I can give you power over everyone. Talk about temptation of more. We are watching the need for power play out in our world right now. And Jesus answers back, I worship the Lord your God and I serve only him. In the Lord I have enough. I don't need more power. I don't need more people to respect me. I only need the Lord. In the Lord, I have enough. God gives me what I need. I do not need your earthly power, for I have come with divine power. And then the devil brings him to Jerusalem. He says to him, well, hey then, the Lord's enough. Why don't you prove it? Throw yourself down. The Lord's enough. I've read scripture. I've seen it said that the angels will catch you. They won't even let you stub your toe. Go ahead. Prove to me that your Lord is enough, that God is all that you claim God is. Perhaps this is the greatest temptation of all, to be more right, to be more sure in our Lord, to be more confident in the promises of God. And Jesus says, don't test God. There is nothing I can do, Jesus is saying to the devil, that will prove this to you, and you know that. It's a false argument. That's the temptation. 
prove that you're right. Prove the power of your God. The power of God cannot be proven. It can only be accepted. That is why we call it faith. And after this, the devil goes away and will eventually seek a new way to tempt a different person into the path that the devil desires for the world. And this will take place on Good Friday as we think about the end of the season of Lent. But here at the beginning of the season of Lent, I'd like you to think about what more draws you? I've been thinking about this a lot, you know, in addition to reflecting on these scriptures and, and praying about them. And, but as I was, you know, coming into the season of, of Lent, I had this drive within myself to look at excess. What do I have more than enough of and yet am never satisfied with? There's always this desire within me to have more. And I decided to pull my Lenten practice from a place of excess, to, to live minimally within that, knowing that, you know, in, in a few weeks I'll be able to go back to living in the more and all those things. It's, it's a temporary thing, and I recognize that. But to, to, and to force myself to live a, a minimal part of my life that is normally a piece of excess. And that was kind of what, I, what drove me to think about what I wanted to give up and, and what practice. So if you haven't yet chosen something for your practice of Lent, perhaps that's a way to approach it. What, what do you as a family have excess of and, and how could you minimize it even for just a day um, once a week or for part of the season of Lent or for all of the season of Lent? When I think about wanting more, I just see it so powerfully in my own life. I want to be more important. I don't know that I would say I want to be more powerful because there's a part of me that recognizes that with power comes responsibility, or at least that's what my ethics drive me to. So I tend to not be interested in more power because I don't really want more responsibility. But there was a time where power seemed to be all about accolades. And that I wanted more of, and I could be drawn into. It takes time to mature into our ethical systems. And certainly there are people that take power without the responsibility. They don't mind abusing that power. They don't mind that others will suffer as they take the more away from the few. And so they embrace that. I think about the struggles in my past that I've had with food. My body was always driving me to consume more. My body didn't have an off switch. It's one of the reasons I struggled with, with, with weight. And, and I've been um, you know, told by my surgeon that likely I was born with some type of hormonal imbalance that caused that to happen as a child. But because they didn't know that you know, 40 years ago, there was no correcting for that through either medication or through dietary, you know, there would have been a specific way of saying, this is how she needs to eat, and this will really help that hormonal imbalance, and they could have raised me that way. Well, nobody knew that. Um, that. We know it now. We could help me now, but we didn't know that then. And so my whole life, I didn't understand when people talked about being full. Why would you not want more ice cream? When people said two cookies is enough, I thought they were insane. Why would you not want more cookies? And even after all the work I've done, even after having surgery to modify my body that has made this better, even though my body now gets sick if I have too much more, my tongue still drives me to want to put more into my mouth. It is only the fact that I know that my stomach will get very nauseous and my head will have an extreme headache that stops me from doing so. And I am grateful for that, right? But friends, our tongues, whoo, they can drive us not only for more consumption, but for speaking more to say more words. And you're like, yeah, Amanda, you're in the middle of a sermon. I, but you know what I'm saying, right? We use more words when less words in a relationship might actually be better. We say things that don't need to be said because we want to be more right. This temptation is so prevalent. And as I was reading and studying around the scriptures this week, the sermon series that I'm using comes with these reflective questions. And there was a line in there that said, excess is not abundant. And it took me a minute. Oh, well, that's, that's interesting to think about. 
really, if I could rephrase that in the way that I'm using, having more is not the same thing as living into abundance. When we think of abundance, it is not an abundance of things. It's not an abundance of power. The abundance that we really seek, the only abundance that gives us true contentment, that brings us joy and happiness, is the abundance we find in God. Because God's abundance is grace and love. And it is that grace and love that gives us the abundance of salvation and eternal life. And when I say it's abundance, it's as if God is a bucket pouring out on the world, just this huge, powerful stream of love and of grace, but the bucket never empties. That's the abundance. We cannot use it up. No matter how many more people we invite in, no matter how many new generations are born into it, no matter how much we personally take up because we need more abundance from God, we need more grace, we need more love, we are always needing more of that. And no matter how much we drink from that abundant fountain of water, it does not end. It is an unending supply. It cannot be used up. That is what abundance is. Abundance is something that there is no end to. And the only thing in our world that there is no end to is God and the life we are granted through salvation in Jesus Christ. That's the only thing. Mountains crumble. Oceans rise and fall. As we have discovered in COVID, food can come and go in shortage. Supplies may not always be readily available. Natural resources are consumed and not regenerated at the same rate. We've been struggling with this through forestry, through the use of fossil fuels. Recently in years, we've discovered there is only so much helium in our world. And now how do we blow up our balloons? And yet there is this message in creation. Everything comes to an end. Everything has a life cycle, including the earth itself. Nothing is unending except the abundant love and grace of God that came to be with us in the manifestation that is the life of Jesus Christ. That's the response to the temptation. This more that we're being offered by the world, this more that the devil whispers into our ears, will solve all problems. The problem is, the minute we get to the more, the devil moves the line. Temptation is a lot like the horizon. The closer you get to it, the more it continues to move away from us. The more we get, the more we still want. It is an unending, unsatisfiable craving. It is if someone has punched a hole in our vessel, and it just drains away so that we're constantly trying to get more in the sense that we will fill ourselves up to the brim if only we could have more. And what Jesus is reminding us in these scriptures is there is no earthly thing that will fill you to the brim. The grace and love of God, an unending supply. That is what can fill you to the brim. That is true abundance because it isn't in excess. It is abundance. And then we ask ourselves in this season of Lent, how should we respond to the abundance? As I've already mentioned, part of my practice is in addressing some of the excess, exploring that a little bit, recognizing it. Um, I chose clothing. Maybe you want to choose food or Money, I don't know what your excesses are. Maybe it's electronics. Maybe it's social media accounts. I don't know. You know your life better than I do, and it doesn't really matter. Most of us have way more than one example of excess in our lives. Pick one. Spend some time in prayer around it. Are you trying to substitute excess in that area for the abundant love that you can only find in God, that only comes from God? And then we go back to the passage in Deuteronomy. Now, they were talking about literal first fruits from the harvest, right? 
So these are the persons, we, we heard the story of the unfolding, right? The story of, of the Aramean, which, you know, so this is, this is this, the line of, of Abraham down to Joseph, who ends up in Egypt, and he's just, his family, his brothers come during a famine, and they move, and it's just this one family, and then they grow, and they become a people, and Egypt gets worried about that, and so they enslave the Israelites, known as the Hebrews at the time, and it becomes a more and more oppressive relationship. In, in essence, the Egyptians fall into a pattern that we are stuck in. They realize that their more can come at the expense of another human being. And that really is the sin of excess. It isn't just that we tell ourselves this false narrative that it will solve all problems and make us happy. Excess comes at the expense of another human. Abundance comes for the benefit of all and to the glory of God. So the people that are telling this story in Deuteronomy, they know what it is to be the victims of another culture's excess. And in some ways, they want to make sure they don't become that. So it's not only giving acknowledgement to God for all that God has done, but it is a spiritual discipline to say, how can we make sure that we remain humble. We've been given this land. They've been given land. And it's this land of milk and honey. It is a fertile place. And for an agrarian nation, farmers and what we think of as ranchers or herders, right? You know, you're, you're talking people that have animals and, and people that, have, that are growing crops. To be in a fertile valley of land in a place that is often arid and without water is, you know, this amazing experience. And one of the reasons that that land was so desirable throughout past millennia. And so they've been given this land. It would be so easy to forget that it came from God and to say, ah, this is my land. And if I only have a little bit more land, I could have more. And, and then, you know, now that I have a little bit more land, I need a few more servants. And well, now that I have a few more servants, I need a little bit more of this and a little bit more of that and a little bit more of this. And one of their ways to try to keep from living into that lifestyle, though, as with all of us, they will be tempted by their own sins and have their own struggles. But in the text of Deuteronomy is a hint for all of us. How should we respond to the abundance of God? That is the question they're asking themselves. And they are told to take the very first produce before you eat anything. So you might be hungry, but before you consume, bring it to a place of worship, whether it's a temple, whether it's a church, whether it's simply a place in your home that God is. Take a moment of worship with a blessing, with the fruits that the Lord has given you. I wonder what it would look like to come home from the grocery store this week in my life. And as I'm unpacking groceries to pull out a clementine, to light a candle and put that clementine in front of it and take a moment to thank God for the abundance that goes beyond my physical needs. Because that's what they're told to do, not only to bring part of the first fruit in a basket and they give it and there's all these directions, but it is verse 11 that I want you to hear. So right before the end of verse 10 says, set the produce before the Lord your God, bowing down before the Lord your God. So take this moment of worship, give thanks to God, might be another way of phrasing that. And, but then this is what verse 11 says, and this is the piece we forget. Then celebrate all the good things the Lord your God has done for you and your family, each one of you, along with the Levites who are the priests and the immigrants who are among you. Everyone should be a part of this celebration. This is how we resist the temptation of more. When was the last time you celebrated all that the Lord has given you? Whether you do that when you're unpacking your groceries, whether you're hanging a new clothing item in your closet, whether you're giving thanks for a new friendship or relationship that has come into your life, for a prayer that has been answered, for healing that has happened, for financial stability that has come your way, for the job that you were seeking, whatever it is that is a fruit for you, that is a gift from God, to remember to respond with a moment of worship, 
a moment of thanks be to God, but then to celebrate, and not to celebrate alone, but to celebrate with everyone. There should be an outpouring. Most weeks, when we gather here in the building, we go through the ritual of what we call joys and concerns. And while there are always a handful of joys, more often than not, we seek prayer for the concerns more than the joy. But what God is saying to us through the passages of Deuteronomy is, friends, every week, there should just be this moment of joy where we can hardly get people to shut up because they are celebrating all that God has given to them. I give thanks for my children. I give thanks for my spouse. I give thanks for my family. I give thanks for my home. I give thanks for my job. I give thanks for my food. I give thanks for my clothes. I give thanks for that. I give thanks, thanks, thanks. It, it should be this cacophony of joy. It shouldn't be organized. It should be messy. It should be a party of celebration, just calling out all that the Lord has given. I give thanks that God loves me. I give thanks for salvation. I give thanks for Jesus Christ in my life. I give thanks for my brothers and sisters in Christ. Whatever it is, we should be giving thanks. This is how we respond to the abundance of God. And this is how we set our minds, our hearts, our souls, and even our bodies into a place to resist temptation. I do not need more because look at what I have. And just because more is possible does not mean that more is better. Excess is not abundance. Excess is not abundance. More is not enough. More will never be enough. Let us give thanks to God for the abundance of grace and love poured out upon us, shared with us from others. Let us sing of it with song. And most of all, as it fills us up and spills out, let us carry that joy that gratitude for abundance into our lives and the world this week and let it rain down upon the people around us to not give in, to talk about the things that we don't have. And it isn't that there aren't real things that people don't have. I, I understand that. But to recognize as hard as that is, even if it means the death of my body, I have enough more years on earth will never be enough. How many years is enough? It's never enough. Every time I celebrate a life, whether that life is 50 years old or that life was 95 years long, it's never enough. The people whose loved one is 95 miss the person just as much as the person who was 50, sometimes more. More is not enough. Excess is not abundant. It is in God that we find all we need to sustain the essence of who we are. Let us share that with others. Offer that hope to others in the world this week. Beloved, will you pray with me? Glorious God, we give you thanks for what we do have not for what we don't. We recognize that we do have people, even if it is a single friend, a single relative, a single brother or sister in Christ. In you, we have enough. We give you thanks for our clothing, for our food, for our homes, for companionship, for the beauty of your created earth. We give you thanks. And we are humbled. Even as we complain, even as we continue to cry out, always wanting more, you continue to respond with your grace, your grace of healing, your grace of forgiveness, your grace of redemption. You fill us up to the brim with your love, 
transforming us, renewing us, and once again, restoring us in your blessed water. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Amen. Beloved, I send you forth into the world. May you be full. May you take moments and like invite God to pour into you this week. And when you can, as you go through the world, splash some water on those around you, would you? Believe me when I tell you, they are dry too. They are also seeking the abundance that can only be found in God. And sometimes that abundance comes to us through other people. Be the other people in the world this week, pouring out upon the world all that you have received. May God bless you, restore you, redeem you, and be with you till we meet again.